We're very pleased today to have as our guest Dr. Stephen Mintz, who comes to us from the uh, Institute for Transformational Learning in the University of Texas system. He has a long and quite various career. One of the things that's true about people in this room is everyone is sort of various. We come from different places and have landed in an unusual collaboration. So I think your, your career kind of talks to some of this. He has been a historian, written a number of books, including books on the history of childhood. And since he got to the end of that, he wrote a book on the history of adulthood. Um, what comes next? <laughs> We're living. Right, yeah, OK. Um, this Institute for Transformational Learning is a system-wide effort at the University of Texas that aims to increase access, affordability, and student success across the board in the Texas system. There's an opportunity in Texas to do this on a grander scale than almost anywhere else, and who would not want to do it except, I mean, who would want to do it more than Texas wants to do something? We really look forward to hearing you. Thank you. I lead two lives. Uh, I'm a mild-mannered historian who works on the life course, and I'm responsible for administering a $50 million fund to improve access, affordability, and student success. And those two interests very much overlap. And so I want to say a few words about the life course before I talk about what I'm up to. The 20s have become the decisive decade in young people's lives. People's life trajectory is defined during their 20s. Indeed, the 20s have replaced the teens as the most risk-filled decade in a person's life. It's during those years that way too many kids' lives go awry. For some, of course, the 20s is the takeoff period. It's a time of self-discovery, exploration, travel, resume building. But for many others, it's the time when their lives begin to fall apart. Mental health problems begin to manifest themselves most often during the 20s. And for about a quarter of American young people, their lives are headed in the wrong direction, and there usually is no recovery. That is, for a quarter of American young people, by their mid-20s, they never graduated from high school, they've been convicted of a serious crime, they're in prison or on probation, they had a child as a teenager, or they're disconnected from both school and the job market. That's 25%. Now, at the other end, there's about 30, 35% who get a college degree, right? And then there's that other big chunk, 40% or so, who attended college, accumulated debt, and never received a degree. And we know that in this society, if you don't have a degree, it's almost the same economically as if you just graduated from high school. It's a sad fact. But even for many young people who do get a degree, Many of them will flail and flounder for years after graduation before they finally fall into a steady job that may or may not reflect their talents or their interests. And we know what produces success in that period of the 20s. It's simple. It's parental resources. That is, the real safety net for young people in their 20s is their parents and their bank account or their living room couch. And that allows young people to take advantage of the activities that will catapult them ahead. And if you don't have that, that's a very sad situation. 
And universities, I don't think, have done an adequate job of helping to solve this huge societal problem. Okay. Now, uh, to use a couple of metaphors, one from Chrysler, uh, you can lead here at the University of Michigan, you can follow or you can lag behind, or to use a football metaphor like we would in Texas, you can play offense or you can play defense or you can stand on the sidelines, right? And my recommendation to you is, of course, you should have a leadership role. As one of the two premier public higher institutions in this country, you in Berkeley, I think you have a particular responsibility to serve the public. And as higher ed is being reconfigured in the face of many forces, it's your responsibility to really push us forward and envision what the education of the 21st century should look like. But before I get into specifics, let me make a few general comments about American higher education. We have vastly increased access to higher ed. Over the last three decades, we increased enrollment by 55%. Very impressive. But uh, we did that in a very peculiar way. That is, we tracked students by race, by class, by facilities, by infrastructure, by institutional amenities, by student-faculty ratios, and by expenditures per student. Uh, in other words, we increased capacity, but we did it in a way that benefited the more privileged students overall and disadvantaged the least privileged students. And in fact, the way the financing of higher education works, it's inverse to need. That is, there is an inverse relationship between funding, institutional selectivity, and institutional size, and what students need to succeed. Stanford economists made the point bluntly, this is statistics from just a few years ago, uh, low selectivity colleges have resources of about $12,000 per student per year. The most selective colleges have resources of $92,000 a year. That's $80,000 difference. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, you want different outcomes? That's how to do it, right? So. American higher education's record, I think, is very mixed. We accomplished one part of our mission, increasing access, but we didn't successfully complete the other part of our mission, which is to help students succeed. We did increase the number of selective colleges over the last period. Uh, last 30 years uh, by about 20 percent, but we increased student body by much more than that. And so what do we have? We have this. The United States now has the lowest college completion rate of any developed country. And the explanation's simple. Uh, we have a higher proportion of low-income students a higher proportion of non-traditional students, including part-time students, and a higher proportion of transfer students. And even at many four-year institutions, not this one, 
but many. Graduation rates are too low. Time to degree is too long. And who knows anything about student learning outcomes because we have no measures anyway. Uh, and so we need, it seems to me, to really think through our mission and how we can transform these circumstances. Now, I'm in a somewhat different position than you are. You do not have a system. I have a system to be responsible for. Uh, but many of the innovations that need to be developed will be developed at institutions like this one should you choose to accept that mission. And I know there are many people in this room who are already doing that. But they need to be scaled and they need to be seated at other institutions. And it would be a gross mistake and I think a violation of your responsibility if you focus exclusively on the 28,000 students on this campus and don't think that you have bigger <coughs> societal mission. Now, uh, the challenges facing higher ed, you know, are pretty obvious and they're well known. Graduation rates, learning outcomes, cost, a business model that is fragile and seems threatened, uh, curricular alignment, diversity, institutional inertia. We'll talk a little bit about those problems. But in the past, we could live with all those problems because higher ed's job was to sort, right? Those who would be well qualified to become leaders and professionals, doctors and lawyers, and those who weren't equipped to do that. But that paradigm, I think, is over. And now it's our job to think universally about student success, to embrace the mantra of 100% proficiency, at least as our platonic ideal, if not reality. And so the paradigm shift that I advocate is to a view of our students as partners and students as producers, as creators of knowledge. Your students are too good to simply be the passive recipients of information. They have all kinds of skills, knowledge that need to be tapped. And especially at a research university, they need to be part of the process of creating knowledge. Perhaps not all students at all institutions, but certainly at a place like this one. Now, you're all familiar, I think, with the larger paradigm shift that's going on, that we're moving from a model rooted in the industrial age to a model rooted in the information age. That is, the mass production model of education no longer makes much sense. The transit, transmission model, professor to student, is being replaced by an interactionist model. Sink or swim is being replaced by an emphasis on student success. An artisanal approach where each lone eagle creates her or his own class is being replaced gradually by a notion of teams developing courses. And there's the first experiments in moving away from a course-centric, semester-centric model of education to a model that is much more flexible and much more personalized. So what do I think needs to happen. I am convinced that the, and I'm staking my career on it, so I better be convinced of this, uh, that the area that we need to think hardest about 
is curricular design. We often think about course design. We often think about pedagogy. But my conviction is that we're looking at the wrong area and that we need to be thinking about the curriculum itself. Very rarely in a department, even within a single major, is there much thought given to the learning trajectory, to the relations between courses, to the sequencing of information, to the development of themes and skills. And that's where I think we have missed the vote and need to devote much more attention. And so what I've been thinking about is what I call degree verticals. Now, for some students, an education that involves electives is wonderful. It's a way to enrich their lives, develop kind of dilettantish understanding of multiple fields. It's a wonderful thing for the students that I'm dealing with, who are 45% African American and Latino, 50% are Pell Grant eligible. Uh, at one of my campuses, Lower Rio Grande Valley, we're talking about the poorest and third poorest counties in the United States, average household income 23,000. For many of those students, they need to see a real value proposition to their degree, and it needs to be as expedited, as optimized as possible. Because at every point, they are measuring the cost-benefit analysis of staying in school. And if they're not, I can assure you their parents and other family members are, versus getting a job. And so what I've been thinking a lot about are these degree verticals. Now, what do I mean by a degree vertical? They're like a major, but they begin with the gen ed requirements, and they are backward designed from professional school or graduate school to see what you need to know and at what point you need to know it. And our hope is to begin these degree verticals not freshman year, but in high school or community college, so that these pathways are really glide paths where the alignment, the articulation, is not a problem. 70% of the students in my system are transfer students. That is, they've taken some courses elsewhere. And often, those courses are not well aligned with the university courses. And so they hit a brick wall. They think they have completed a requirement, and they haven't. And we need to figure out a way to make sure that does not happen if they're going to be successful. So I also talk about an optimized curriculum. And that means, in practice, trying to break through departmental boundaries and to get faculty from multiple departments sitting together and thinking this through. So let me give you a practical example. We are launching in the fall, that is August, a middle school to medical school pathway. Now, will it lead? To medical school for all the students? Of course not. It's designed to lead to the health professions. Some will become nurses and some will become physician's assistants. Some might go into health informatics. They're going to go into some area of health care. Hopefully many of them will become doctors. Okay. And we thought through the entire curriculum. So at the general education level, the composition courses are all tailored around virtual grand rounds. That is, professors from our medical schools will virtually 
lead these students through grand rounds, and the students will, writing projects will involve observation, diagnostics, the very skills that they would be developing if they were a medical student, obviously at a different level. But it will be authentic practice, and the meaning of it will be completely clear to these students. Right? Um, the basic science courses will be tailored to this biomedical science track. So our physics classes, our chemistry classes, have been rethought so that they're aligned better with the focus of this degree program. And furthermore, we're altering the scheduling of the courses. These are students who have to work. Uh, at the campus that we're going to be launching this program first, all of the students are working 20 hours a week or more. So they will be in one of three cohorts. There'll be a morning cohort, an evening cohort, and a Saturday cohort. They will be on campus eight hours a week, and they will take all their classes with a cohort. Now this is competency-based education, and it's very gamified, that is, Students get points for everything they do, and they'll know how they're doing compared to other students. Uh, again, we're trying to motivate students as best we can to keep them clearly on track and engaged. And many of their projects they'll be able to do outside of the classroom because they have to be there. They have to be away. Now, a key part of our vision is to replace the commercial textbook. And we're replacing the commercial textbook with what we call courseware. So the, these are hybrid programs, but the part that you do when you're not on campus is not watching video lectures. Instead, the courseware includes embedded diagnostics that figure out what you know and what you don't know and where you're confused. It includes personalized learning pathways so that we can adjust to just those areas you don't really understand or that you've forgotten. It's very activity-driven and challenge-based because we're convinced that Simulations are one of the ways we're going to keep students actively engaged. Now this courseware is blueprinted by faculty members, and in some cases we're using materials faculty members have created. They're compensated for that. But in many cases we're uh, either curating materials that have been created elsewhere, or we're developing our own materials. And so we're eliminating textbook costs. We're providing every student with the materials they need to work successfully through. And this way, we can also do the fine-grained learning analytics so we can really refine the personalized learning pathways. We can see the pinch points in the curriculum. We can identify students' confusions. And we can remediate that in real time. Faculty are used to using textbooks. And so this isn't a fundamental change. It's an incremental change. Faculty are still running the face-to-face -face portion of the class, but we're able to augment that, I think really enhance that, using these online resources. So every student in the program will get an iPad. Uh, when they come to campus, it will download the relevant materials and upload the materials they need. 
In the Rio Grande Valley, the students have very poor connectivity, so we have to do it this way. Um, data analytics, of course, is essential to this project, and it's been so exciting during my visit here to hear the incredibly exciting things you're doing with data. Um, we think that a key to doing this is to develop a personal, progressive student profile. That is, we're trying to draw in from various data silos all the information we can get about students so we can really follow their progress. And we're trying to align this with the community colleges since their students are our students later on. We're going to make use of predictive algorithms not to discourage students, but to try to encourage students and to make them more successful. We're very aware that often students take what we call toxic course combinations. You take four heavy writing courses or four heavy reading courses or something that's almost going to guarantee your failure. We need to advise them to be safer. Now, course delivery is something that we've had to think an awful lot about. And I've become more and more of an advocate for certain students who have to work or have to be provide caregiving to their families that a low residency model might be the way to go. They need a cohort. They need the support of a professor. They need something to help keep them on track. But we can't expect them to come to campus four or five times a week. In the lower Rio Grande Valley, there is no public transportation at all. There is not even a bus system. So again, we have to work with the realities that we face. And we can get the students to campus some, but we can't get them to campus every day. And so we're going to design a program that can fit their schedules. Now, what should the university of the 21st century look like? Uh, all of us, I'm sure, in this room have been thinking a lot about that as an issue. And there are a lot of different models out there. And none of us are so prescient that we know what's going to happen. There are some exceedingly exciting experiments going on. And I don't know which will last and which will not. Um, but let me just mention to you a few different models that I think we're seeing or we're going to see more of. One is, of course, an accelerated model where courses are better aligned or they're created in interdisciplinary clusters and they allow students to finish more quickly. Students are already doing this more than we think. In many states, students are taking college courses while in high school. At the University of Texas at Austin, the average student is bringing in 15 hours of credit the day they arrive on campus. This has had devastating effects to the business model, which was always dependent on large lecture classes supporting small seminars. That model doesn't work anymore now that the students have taken those gen ed classes already. Of varying quality, to be sure. Right? But our state legislature has mandated that those count towards their degrees. And so there's no problem with that. So accelerated pathways is one. Uh, bare bones universities, I think, are going to appear. Do we really need climbing walls? or wellness centers, or believe it or not, football stadiums. Uh, you know, one interesting model that I've 
uh, I'm familiar with. Those folks in Silicon Valley are experimenting with various techniques. One that uh, model that I think will be instituted not so in the distant future, um, there will be a rigorous core curriculum, and then there'll be a co-op mentored internship experience for the second two years. The students will get a degree from a prestigious liberal arts college, uh, but they'll be in New York City. Uh, this, this liberal arts college has high schools, so the students will go to those high schools on Saturdays, so they'll get some face-to-face -face experience, but a lot of this will be delivered online, and the price will be a community college price. No, this is a nonprofit version of Life Minerva. I mean, it's an interesting model. We'll see if, uh, I don't know how scalable it is, uh, but students will get a real degree. It'll be cheaper than City University of New York. Might work. Uh, I mean, it's, it, you know, these are, you know, I'm not advocating anything. All I'm saying is there's lots of interesting things going on. There's other kinds of experimental models taking place, like Minerva, right? Um, one area that I think has a, developed under the radar screen is the growth of corporate universities. Corporate universities used to mean Hamburger U, McDonald's University, or Clown College, Ringling Brothers University. Uh, you know, they were like barber colleges, right? Nobody in higher ed cared about them because they weren't competition. But Deloitte is a university outside of Dallas, right? They don't give degrees. But a student who's thinking of going to an MBA program might decide that not getting a degree from Deloitte is worth more than a degree from the Macomb School at the University of Texas at Austin. I don't know, right? There are now 4,000 corporate universities. Again, they are not challenging us on the accreditation front, and they're not competing for undergraduates. But they have the potential, I think, to have a huge impact on our professional programs and some of our continuing ed programs. So General Motors now partners with, of all things, Indiana University. Uh, for business courses, but maybe they would decide they'd do it themselves if they thought it was cheaper or better. Another challenge, I think, or another possibility uh, in this vision of the future is distributed universities. And what I mean by distributed universities is universities that serve a vast geographical area. One example is Arizona State University, 86,000 students on four different campuses, but it's really one university. It's not four branches with their own duplication and leadership, right? It's trying to distribute across multiple venues. And I think this is going to become more common because with technology, you can deliver the lectures. Uh, you can deliver a seminar-like experience. You can do this synchronously or asynchronously, uh, and you can bring education closer to people that you want to serve, to various stakeholders. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Uh, and this is sort of like the notion of a university in the cloud that can be delivered in multiple venues all at the same time. But what about a place like the University of Michigan. I mean, how should it envision its future? Now, I wrote all this before I came and knew anything, right? So, uh, and of course, you discover that many of these uh, developments are already well established at U of M or are, you know, in the prototype stage and will be scaled in the future. But why should anyone go to a research one university? Is it because of football? Is it because of the peers that you have? Those are good reasons, right? 
Uh, but what can you offer that no other place can offer? And I think there are several things. And I think given that the university is a big tent, there's lots of opportunities to implement these. Uh, live and let live should be the mantra. And therefore, let a thousand flowers bloom. The most obvious is undergraduate research, right? If you're at a research university, you should do research. And given the quality of your students, it's ridiculous not to have them do research. The challenge is to figure out how to scale that. And the answer strikes me as fairly self-evident. In the 19th century, when they were expanding public schools, they used what was called the Lancaster approach. You had one teacher. The teacher had two assistants. The assistants trained advanced students. And the advanced students taught the other students. And we need to adopt a model sort of like that, I think. That is professor, postdocs, graduate students, peer mentors. And that way, we can serve huge numbers of students. At the University of Texas at Austin, 700 students, mainly at-risk students, are in a freshman research experience in the sciences. And the sections themselves are led by senior students who are overseen by graduate students, who are overseen by postdocs, and then by faculty. And it seems to work pretty well, and it's had a real impact on student success. And anyway, it's a wonderful experience for the students. So we, I think, need to figure out how to scale research and not just in the sciences. We want our students to do what we do. You have fantastic archives on this campus. The students, even as freshmen, should be in your archives in history classes. They had history in fifth grade, eighth grade, and eleventh grade. Did they really need to take another US history survey course? Of course not. But they could benefit quite a bit, I think, from being in a research experience that only you can offer, right? Because you have the facilities, the rare books collections. Experiential learning needs to be more integrated into the curriculum in all kinds of ways. Now, currently, experiential learning tends to mean internships and study abroad and service learning. But we're imaginative and creative people, and I think we could think of other ways to embed experiential learning in the undergraduate experience. Students, I think, benefit quite a bit from authentic learning experiences, as it is. Much of what students gain at college is from their extracurricular activities. We need to find a way to integrate them better into the educational part of our mission, I think. Students who work on student newspapers or for the radio station or the TV station benefit immensely but it's disconnected usually from their academic experience. Let's figure out how to link them better. Third area is innovation incubators. I was at Stanford at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and I was astonished what an undergraduate education looked like at Stanford these days. Stanford students are like the very best students you have here. They all want to be Mark Zuckerberg. They come to school with a project, and the classes are in the way, right? And what Stanford's really selling these days is access to venture capitalists and to Google and the whole Facebook and the whole infrastructure, right? And the classes look like that. So you don't take art history at Stanford anymore because art history is now connected with computer science or music is connected with engineering. And the classes increasingly are project-based. And the whole goal is to commercialize that project. 
So there's a lot of just-in-time learning. There's a lot of interdisciplinarity built into it because if you need to learn about intellectual property, they bring a law professor in. And if you need to develop a business plan, they bring in business professors, right? And I'm not saying that every student should be doing that, but there needs to be a space for those students, right? And at a campus like this, they're not an infinitesimal number. You know, I don't know if it's 10% of your students, but it's, it's enough so they're worth serving. And they'll give back. Just look at the, you know, over a billion dollars that Stanford got from its alumni last year. Um, next is uh, thinking about uh, international partners and how we can do this well. Uh, MOOCs are, of course, an important step in that direction. Uh, they don't yet have a sustainable business model. They're out of the goodness of somebody's pockets and out of the goodness of professors' hearts. But we know around the world there is a huge need for higher education that cannot be met by bricks and mortar campuses. And we've got to figure out how we, I think, can work with others to provide that kind of training. Partnering with other universities, I'm not sure what form it will take, but I think we should be thinking about that. We have an international audience that's going to grow much faster than the domestic audience. And above all, we need to think about our students as lifelong partners. The average American will hold 11 different jobs in three different career fields, needs retraining. We need to think how our students will be our students not just when they're 18 to 22 or 18 to 26, but how they're going to turn to us throughout their careers for retraining often with modules as opposed to degree programs that really do fit their needs. Uh, that is, 15-week semesters won't cut it, right? That's not what they're looking for. They might be two-week experiences, intensive experiences on campus. They might be online programs. They might be hybrid programs. But the 18 to 22 year old population is shrinking at the moment, but the adult learner professional, working professional market is growing. And either we will serve that market or I can assure you somebody else will serve that market. Um, so in my 30 years in higher ed, this is by far the most exciting moment, right? Everything is fluid. The future is totally uncertain. And you are in the position to shape the future. Uh, I was in New York City. I loved being in New York City. No one loves being in New York more than me. But I was given a once-in-a-lifetime chance to help shape the future of this endeavor that we care so much about. It was a chance to put my politics into action and see if I could dramatically, really exponentially increase graduation rates for students whose lives will really be transformed. When I was a graduate student at Yale, I had, a gra I had an undergraduate who won a Pulitzer Prize three years after I had him. And you knew it. Right, I mean, this just fantastic. And my job was to get out of the way. Uh, but with many students, you will make the difference in their life pathway. And we need to figure out how to do that at scale within the constraints that we have to operate in, that is, the financial constraints that exist around us, the institutional constraints that exist around us, the inertia that pervades our neck of the woods. But just because it's hard doesn't mean it isn't worth doing. That's our 
task. That's our mission. Thank you. towards a competency-based model. Though I'm, I'm very wary of the term competency-based because it has other uh, emanations from it. I mean, when we think of competency-based, we often fully online, self-paced, self-directed, no professors involved. I mean, I, that's not what I'm thinking of. But in the areas that we are currently developing programs, there are professional organizations that have defined the competencies, right? There are licensing exams that people have to pass. This is not, this is not history where, what, what? The standardized test model of exams, though, which we know disadvantage the very kind of students that you're. Well, we're, we're interested in challenge-based, activity-based assessments. They're performance-based assessments. And that's very much what we're moving to. One thing that's, that's been inspiring to me and exciting to me is we're not just working with uh, undergraduate schools. We're working with our medical schools. And we've redesigned their curriculum in a competency-based format uh, because they faced a problem. The knowledge that a physician needs to know has increased hugely, but doctors need to spend more time in clinics and in laboratories at the same time. So how in the world are we going to do this? Well, we need to take a close look at the curriculum and see what could be combined and what could be eliminated and what could be moved down, maybe in the summer before medical school or even in the undergraduate years, so that we can free up time later for what they need. And that's not taking multiple choice tests, right? That is being in a laboratory and becoming a clinician scientist. The phrase that I use is to intentionally design everything, right? I mean, for teaching center people, this is just common sense, but I can assure you it is not common sense elsewhere. That is, what do we really wish to accomplish, and how are we going to accomplish it, and how are we going to know that we actually got there, right? It's, seems straightforward and simple-minded, but all common sense seems that way once you know it. And I think when people begin to reassess this, uh, it, it just changes uh, our whole mentality towards teaching. Let me give one example that inspired me, and then we'll talk about other examples. 
Columbia University has an old-fashioned core curriculum. It is great books. There are no women in first semester uh, of the freshman year. Every student takes exactly the same uh, reading lists in these courses. Because there's a very clear sense among the faculty what students need to know. You need to know Plato, and you need to know Kant, and you need to know Hobbes, and you need to know Hume, and you need to know Marx, and you need to know Tocqueville. I mean, there's not any disagreement. You know, there's only two universities in the country who still believe that, but they do believe it. And so that there is a shared syllabus, everybody who teaches it uses exactly the same syllabus, and every week there are two meetings. There's a pedagogy meeting when you talk about all the problems and strategies, and there's a lecture by an expert on the subject from outside. So this is taken extremely seriously, and you know, I think uh, it is what it is, but it's a great experience, right? It's not something you could do at the University of Michigan. Uh, it wasn't something they could do at Stanford. Uh, it, but it's nice to see that, but it's a very intentionally designed curriculum with all kinds of requirements, but still people teach it differently, right? You, you can have the same, I mean, no one feels constrained by this, uh, but you're, you're sort of building on other people's good ideas and trying things yourself. Uh, and that had a lot of influence on the way I think about a curriculum that it's not something you do just all by yourself. You do it in the company of other people. You really think through what your goals are, and you figure out how you're going to get there. And so we've tried to do the same thing with our middle school to medical school curriculum, because it wasn't just faculty members in the biomedical sciences, but it's chemistry <coughs> professors, and it's physics professors, but it's English professors and history professors and others because we're thinking about a curriculum as a whole. And how are we going to put that together? You know, it's a sort of thought exercise. Now, my approach is a coalition of the willing approach. Nobody works with me who doesn't want to work with me. I bribe them. They get stipends. Uh, I mean, no one does it for free. Uh, but if you don't want to play, don't play doesn't bother me one way or the other. I only want those people who think this is an exciting experiment and worth failing at. Um, and it's also what I would call an islands of innovation strategy. That is, my hope is if we do something exciting, it will be infectious and it will multiply. Um, it's the only strategy I can think of to work. I mean, I, can't, I don't have dictatorial powers to impose my vision, so I'm hoping that this islands of innovation strategy will work. Uh, so far, it actually does seem to work. Yes? So I, I really enjoyed <coughs> your talk and found myself heavily conflicted several times uh, throughout. And one of those conflictions was with the degree verticals and uh, what you just said about um, being open to it failing, uh, uh, if, it, if it does, yeah. I think, and being e uh, experimental right. is really quite key to me because when I think about uh, my daughter, I'm not sure I want her to decide she's going to be a doctor at 10. This is an option, right? This, we are not replacing all majors. It's just an option. We had 650 applicants. For the first semester, we can serve 170, which creates a, wonderfully a perfect experiment, right? We've been talking to Ithaca to put in place, you know, we're, how we're going to choose the students at all. Uh, it's up to the students to make this decision, and you know whether your daughter decides to go into it or not, or goes into it and then leaves it. it this this seems to me providing options is is a good idea. Uh, it will work for some students. I don't know which yet. I guess my, my, the heart of my question is, um, 
So we can measure the outcome of in, uh, education um, in many different ways. And you mentioned that the US was at the bottom of its developed nations, but that was largely measuring it based on dollars and number of people who have degrees and then what those degrees may be turned This is to. completion rates, completion okay, rates. Completion rates. That's an, uh, of people who entered four-year right. schools and got out. Right. Every other England, Germany, France, everybody does better than us. Right. They just must have easier schools. Yeah. But, but, um, and they don't have football, so I think that there's like a perfect correlation, right? I'm curious, how, how with these degree verticals will you keep, uh, if it's important to keep, a sense of a, a well-rounded scholar, a person who is, is educated broadly enough so that there's that benefit to society and interactions in society beyond just getting a job and having a nice high wage, but that they're engaged in civic politics and that they're... Well, first of all, we're very interested in what we call professional identity formation. And a lot of the activities are designed to foster that sense of what a professional is in that field. And a doctor is not a glorified plumber who works on the human body, not to disparage plumbers. Uh, a doctor needs to know about ethics. A doctor needs to know about interpersonal relationships. A doctor needs to be extraordinarily observant. And a doctor needs to be aware of the policy debates surrounding medicine. And we think that these, which we are embedding in the core curriculum, uh, can then provide vantage points on history, literature, uh, philosophy, and the other things that we care about. Uh, you know, we, many of our institutions, yours and mine, have distribution requirements that students view as obstacles. They don't view it as a chance at enrichment, right? Uh, if geology is easier than astronomy, then they're going to take geology. Uh, they're not asking cosmological questions about the nature of you know, the Earth or the nature of the universe, right? This is about an obstacle in the way. Um, in other words, I think I'm going to give them something better than what they're generally getting. Now, is that the best of all possible worlds? Probably not. But is it better than what they're getting? And is it going to give them a holistic perspective if they become a professional in their field? Damn right. That's my thinking, at least. Right, let's take one more question. Probably not this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we'll no. Uh, so I'm wondering the, the middle school and middle school. Yeah. Well, it's a competency-based program, and competency is defined as a B level. And you do not complete the course until you achieve mastery. That is a B level. And for some students, our sense is that could be quicker. And for some students, it'll be slower. And for some students, it'll be not at all. Um, but our working theory, our hypothesis, is that with the right support and with the right pedagogy and the right uh, curricular pathway, we can get a much higher percentage of students to go. Now, what that percentage is, uh, we'll see. Uh, though if you're starting at 19.6%, as I am at one of my campuses, I think I can get higher than that. Um, now, a big part of what we're doing is trying to put in place a coaching model. Uh, there are things, you know, for-profit schools like Kaplan or P uh, uh, Phoenix, you know, are the, are the devils to higher ed. But they, that doesn't mean they don't have good ideas worth stealing. And one of the 
ideas that's well worth stealing, really it's two ideas, a life coach whose job it is to deal with registration and financial aid issues, and eventually with career issues, and an academic coach who could be there when you're having a problem and our personalized adaptive system's not solving that problem for you. And we're trying to figure out strategies to provide that kind of support. Now, there are many faculty who you know, have a lot of misgivings about this, because after all, faculty are all great mentors and advisors, so why would we need anything else? Uh, I, I personally have some doubts about that, but uh, at the university. Have any doubts about that. <laughs> <laughs> we think we need to give a wraparound system of support to these students or it's not going to work. Uh, and I think it's going to be helpful to the students just to know it's there, that with a click of their mouse, they can get somebody to help them uh, in, not immediately, but within several hours at least. Whether that's a peer mentor or a professional advisor, a graduate student, I mean, we're going to use a variety of different kinds and try to see what works best. So, so kind of following up on Stephanie's question, though, too, like when you think about standardized testing in particular, like national tests, ACTs and SATs, <coughs> how does that figure into the calculation as, as a student moves from post-secondary to... These are very broad access schools, and we're not going to have, I mean, there are, they do have admissions requirements but they're pretty elastic. And we're going to take the students we get, um, because that's the students they have. This is not going to be privileged, and we're going to see how it works out. Uh, again, that's the value of data analytics, to see you know, if there may be factors that predict failure absolutely, and then we'll take that into account. We need to know that, though. We can't. I don't want to hypothesize about that before we, we actually know. All right, let's thank Dr. Thank Mintz you. again.